in a way we're transforming a partnership that was once built solely on student and alumni connections into a partnership that really is at the heart of the strategic priorities of both schools. So looking to the future, the School of Management can depend on the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies as a strong partner in developing leaders for business and society in the area of sustainable uh, development. So we look forward very much to working together uh, on this partnership and you see some of uh, that reflected in the panel that we have for you uh, today. So as we think about the path uh, to resilient uh, prosperity in the discussion that we're going to hear, I'm, uh, I'm delighted that I'm, that I'm not on the panel. You know, uh, we're in a, a situation where the scientific community is strongly urging action on a whole host of issues. Policymakers um, uh, are at loggerheads, scarcely talking to each other, and we have polarized public sentiment. The way forward is not uh, uh, a simple one. It's complicated. So my role today is to handle the easy part and simply introduce our panel of experts and our moderator. So starting uh, at the far, far end on your left, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Pavan Sukhdev. Pavan is uh, founder and CEO of GIST Advisory, a specialist consulting firm which helps governments and corporations discover, measure, value, and manage their impacts on natural and human capital. Uh, he's a visiting fellow here at Yale. Uh, he served as our 2011 McCluskey uh, Fellow and wrote his book, Corporation 2020, while here at Yale. Earlier, he was a special advisor and head of the UN Environment Program's Green Economy Initiative and lead author of their report toward a green economy. He was also study leader for the G8 plus 5 Commission project on the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity, the so-called TEAB reports. And Pav uh, Pavan was appointed to lead TEAB by the EU Commission and, uh, and Germany and delivered his interim report while still working full-time at Deutsche Bank in 2008. Oh, so Pavan, it's a, a great pleasure uh, to have you here Thanks, Peter. today. Uh, next Pavan, uh, Francis Beinecke. Uh, Francis is president of the Natural Resources Defense Council and is one of the most distinguished alumni of the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies and Yale College as a whole, and obviously one who has strong connections both with our school and the School of Management here that was founded by her father. Um, Francis, uh, for many years, chaired the Leadership Council of the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies uh, and is a former member of the Yale uh, Corporation. Under Francis's leadership, NRDC has launched a new strategic campaign that sharply focuses efforts on establishing a clean energy future that curbs climate change, that focuses also on reviving the world's oceans, defending endangered wildlife and wild places, and protecting our health by preventing pollution, fostering sustainable communities, and ensuring safe and sufficient water. I could go on about all of uh, Frances's achievements at, at NRDC, but I just want to mention one other thing. She was appointed to by President Obama to the National Commission on the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill and offshore drilling. So she brings a wealth of experience to our panel today. Welcome, Francis. Uh, next, uh, Peter Bucker joined the World Business Council on Sustainable Development as president in January 2012, having been involved as a member for a number of years in his role of uh, chief executive officer of TNT-NV, the Netherlands-based holding company of TNT Express and Royal TNT Post. Peter's a respected leader in corporate responsibility a recipient of the Clinton Global Citizen Award in 2009 and the SAM Sustainability Leadership Award in 2010. He's also a UN WFP ambassador against uh, hunger. So Peter, we're delighted to have you here. Thank you for taking the time uh, to be with us. And finally, our moderator today is uh, Brad Gentry, a member of the FES uh, faculty. Uh, his work explores the opportunities for using private investment to improve uh, environmental performance. His sectoral work is concentrated in two main areas, increasing private investment in the delivery of urban environmental services, particularly drinking water and sanitation, and also in sustainable forest use and management. So this is our panel, and my job now is to hand over to Brad. Brad, please take it away. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Peter.
And you can see why we're excited to start this discussion. No PowerPoints, um, interactions across the panelists. Um, and what we thought we would do would be to ask each of our panelists to talk a little bit about the actions they're taking to help put the world on a path uh, toward a more sustainable future. And then talk a little bit about the implications for business schools and MBA students of those actions. So Peter, if I might start with you, WBCSD has a long history of being a thought leader in the role of business uh, and sustainability, but you've really been taking it in a more action-oriented direction. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for listening to me. I'm really intimidated to be here, <laughs> to be honest. I'm not a Yale alumni. Um, we could change that. I'm my, my <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. <laughs> my English is rather broken, and uh, to make matters worse, I'm Dutch, so diplomatic skills are completely <laughs> missing. <laughs> so, any, anything could happen this afternoon. Um, I'm glad to see so many young people in the room, because we're talking about the future of our planet and societies, and uh, we really need you to fix a number of things. So. Despite wearing a beard, I do represent business. <laughs> um, I'm not Greenpeace, even though I'm European and um, we tend to be slightly left of your whatever. <laughs> so anyway, so um, let me talk about WBCSD, which is the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. It's an organization uh, out of Geneva, Switzerland, which is my home. Um, we have 200 global companies working together on sustainability issues. So all I do these days since uh, two years now is think and act about sustainability. And I'm relatively uh, clear about that space. It's a traveling circus which is delivering absolutely nothing. <laughs> if I kind of summarize in my Dutch way <laughs> what I found uh, when I joined. And the urgencies out there are ramping up at such pace that this is a real tragedy and we need to try to change that. So when I uh, joined WBCSD or I was asked to join WBCSD given my knowledge of business and the track record we built in sustainability, I said we need to move this to action. Everything that needs to be written about sustainability has been written by now. We don't need more books and analysis. We need action and more importantly even than the action we need, we need action that can be scaled up. So scalability, replicability of solutions that will deal with the sustainability challenges is basically all I think about these days. And we've created the program and we're actually going to partner with Yale University, <clears throat> both with the Forest and Environment School as well as with the School of Management to see how we can better use the world of science, the world of the, the management schools to, to scale up ideas that we have and that other people may bring. We've done basically two things. Action 2020 is a transition or translation from a thing called Vision 2050. If you've never seen it, you should go to wbcsd.org. It was written before my day, so I'm not <laughs> advertising my own work in any way, but it was published in 2010. For the first time, large global business has written down <clears throat> that the world and the society as we know it is not sustainable and what it would take to make the world sustainable. And in a simple shorthand version, the vision is we're going to a world with nine plus billion people. We want them to all live well. So we should stop the fact that every six seconds a child dies from hunger, mm. that there are billions of people who don't have access to water, that there are 1.8 billion people who don't have access to energy. But altogether, we must get back within the boundaries of the planet. It's a great piece of work. It's a great vision. And if you ever want to see the, the definition of sustainability, it's a good place to start. Mm. The problem with Vision 2050, it's too far out particularly in the days that we're in today where the economic pressures are high and the next quarter is difficult enough to predict and the next year might actually be existential questions, 2050 is just too far out. So what we've said, let's create a plan which is called from vision 2050 to action 2020. We've worked with 800 scientists around the world to establish what are the planetary and what are the societal 
priorities. Where is the stress in the system highest? We've selected five, there's an SMS message for someone, five <laughs> natural <laughs> capital priorities and four social capital priorities. So climate change, water, ecosystem degradation, inclusive growth, sustainable lifestyles, and jobs and employment are on those lists. We've agreed for each priority area what are the goals for society. Two degrees warming, no more than a trillion tons carbon. 1.8 billion people by 2030 have access to energy as a climate change goal. And we've translated these goals into what are solutions that business can bring and sc can scale up to reach these goals. That plan, Action 2020, is now being used as the core basis of work in the World Economic Forum, which will happen in two or three weeks from now in Switzerland, where all the world leaders will talk about climate change and what can we do to scale up. So from scientific facts to objectives to solutions with the absolute conviction that business will lead the implementation of solutions. Today, that's very dependent on individual business leaders' visions. Tomorrow, that will have to be dependent on the system that we built. So the second big priority in our work is we are going to redesign capitalism. I'm in America. Yep. I need to be rather cautious in my words. When I'm in Europe, I say we're going to start the revolution of capitalism. <laughs> So what is capitalism? Capitalism is one uses capital and you want something in return. It's called return on capital. That's quite simple. The mistake we've made is we define capital only as financial capital. While we know that business uses natural capital and social capital, and if you ask the really smart people a few more capitals, but the limited capacity that my brain has, financial, natural, social capital. So the redesign of capitalism will be about how do we ensure that we optimize and balance the returns not only on financial capital, but also on social and natural capital. And then you move into the territory of internalizing externalities. And we have Pavan here with us, and he knows a lot more about that than I could ever say. So um, two big things from scientific facts on where is the, the stress high in the system to solutions and to a change in the system, change in the rules of the game that will actually incentivize people to implement these solutions, to improve the business case for them. And that way we're gonna hope to reach scale in the next 10 years. And then all of you young people, mm. you should be trained up to be courageous new leaders and completely turn the system upside down because it's broken, we're in a systemic crisis and we need to really transform our way out of it. Great, well that's, that's uh, I may move to Pavan next in a, yeah. a wonderful way to say, okay, Pavan, you come from a business background, mm. but you're working a lot with governments as they think about these new ways to reflect these externalized costs and benefits mm. um, that set the rules for business. Can you talk a little bit about that work and what you see as the sort of major opportunities and challenges there? Sure. My work's been about uh, the green economy and about uh, valuing natural capital to bring it within the economic lens because what is invisible we just do not account for, do not think about, nor care for typically. Um, but my learning from this has been that given that the corporation, given that the private sector is actually two-thirds of the world economy, GDP and jobs, and in the US, by the way, it's 74 to 75 percent, um, you can't actually do very much as a government alone. You have to recognize where does economic direction come from? Where does resource use come from? And it's in the nature of production and the nature of the design of the corporation itself. So if you weren't shocked enough about Peter's uh, desire to um, redesign capitalism, I'm one stage further. Not very well known for <laughs> being politically correct, but it's about redesigning the corporation as I see it. And to me, the timeline of that redesign is really important because people miss the urgency. Everyone here has heard of planetary boundaries, but very few have looked at the timelines over which they are approached, that we are approaching planetary boundaries. The climate one is well known, 2020, lots of things are supposed to happen by then, but there are other boundaries. So when I, when I look at what governments can do and, and support, it really does become a question of how can they amend micro policies 
to create the new kind of cooperation, which will deliver the right kind of economy, which delivers us well-being and prosperity in the future. And then I pick on your term, uh, Brad, the resilient prosperity. You know, sometimes I, I find myself talking about things like this resilient prosperity, green growth and decoupled growth. And I sort of have a, a, a double take thinking, my God, someone must think I come from the oxymoron brigade. I mean, I speak, I speak <laughs> there's a whole sentence full of oxymorons around here. So it's, sometimes I feel that way as well. And let me explain why. Uh, because going back to basics, profits is surplus. Uh, there are many economists in this audience, so uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but profits is surplus. It can also be a shortfall, and therefore it can be a loss. But the question is, whose profits? And typically we are talking about corporate profits. We're talking about profits off the private sector. But when we do that, what we typically forget is that in the process of delivering the economy, in the process of production, uh, we have third-party costs of doing business as usual. These are called externalities. And what we are trying to optimize is shareholder value, as in value addition, but we are probably not optimizing overall value, including the value of human, social, natural uh, capital that surrounds us, and which may not be privately held. It could be held as public goods or as club goods. There was a calculation done by uh, Bob Ripetto. He was a professor here at Yale University, Ripetto and Dias, 2006. They looked at the US energy sector, and this is interesting. There's lots of companies in the US energy sector. And uh, they calculated economic value addition for these companies, which is straight off the balance sheets. And then they put in adjustments for the costs of the emissions and, and the energy use. And the difference between economic value added and what they call true EVA, true economic value added, uh, was pretty stark. So I have numbers here from that paper. It was uh, two point, it was uh, plus 4.5% on average, that was the economic value added. Whereas when they looked at true EVA, it was minus 2.4%. So there was a 7% jump between uh, appearance and reality, if you like. And when they did a scatter diagram of EVA versus true EVA, it was basically a scatter diagram. There was no correlation, 0.003 or something like that. So what, what does that tell you? That the connection between real value added and actual value added after accounting for externalities is nothing, essentially. And what are these externalities? I mean, uh, Dean Crane, when, when you mentioned the list of uh, sustainability issues, you hit many of them. Greenhouse gases, freshwater preemption, pollution, waste, the change of land use as a result of changing areas from one purpose to the other, be it from forest to field or from forest to car park, as the case may be. And what we have is a situation where this has become the norm, where a business looks only at the private financial capital that it creates, and looks only at shareholder value addition, neglecting, because nobody has asked us to do otherwise, neglecting stakeholder value addition, neglecting social purpose. And that is basically the reason why today's economic model, today's capitalism model, and therefore today's corporation, are really focused on generating private profits and at the same time, public losses. And how much this is, there have been a few studies done. There was one by the UN Principles for Responsible Investment. The top 3,000 corporations around the world, their externalities, $2.15 trillion per annum. That's like 3.5% of global GDP. Some of the big sectors, let me give you a couple which are interesting. And, and I'll stop there, which is basically coal-fired power uh, in Eastern Asia, that's mainly China. Total value addition, $450 billion. Total externalities, $440 billion. Coal-fired power in the US, not very far behind, actually. $317 billion value addition. Externalities, $247 billion. But the one that really takes the cake, or the beef, if you like, is cattle ranching in Latin America. <laughs> Value added $17 billion, externalities $350 billion. Wow. So 18 times as much cost to society in terms of deforestation, not just because of farms, but also because of you know. soya that's grown, which eats into forests even further. So this gives you a sense of how absurd is a system where we are not measuring what we need to manage. What we need to manage is wealth creation. What we are measuring is private profit creation. Hmm. And that goes back to Peter's point, which is that externalities and getting corporations to measure them really, really is, is key. Um, I'll close by saying this, and I'm, uh, this is a quotation from some chap called Oliver Balch, who wrote uh, recently in The Guardian, a British newspaper. 
he basically said that corporate sustainability is too important to be left to corporations. <laughs> and uh, uh, interesting statement, but when I think about it, there's some sense there because if we want to achieve corporate sustainability, you need to level the playing field on which they work and play. You need to ensure that you measure and report externalities. You need to ensure that taxation is aligned towards the incentives that you want, which is taxing the bads and not the goods. In other words, taxing resource use and extraction rather than hard work as in labor or ingenuity as in corporate profits. Uh, you need to contain, we heard this this morning on limiting leverage. Uh, Rick Levin talked about that. He asked this wonderful panel of, of the, the, uh, the, uh, the heads of the world's biggest financial system and, and monetary system, why can't we limit leverage? An absolutely, fundamentally good question because that's actually what we need to do. Too big to fail, how do you stop them from being too big to fail? Or prevent the free flow of leverage without any constraints. And finally, advertising. That wonderful skill which confer converts human insecurities into wants, wants into needs, needs into demand, demand into production, and thereby hangs the tail. <laughs> so yeah, I agree with Peter. We do need to change capitalism, yes. Excellent. So Francis, um, NRDC has developed a wonderful reputation as a fierce defender of natural resources, often through lawsuits against businesses. But the last many years, you've actually been partnering with businesses more regularly. You know, why are you doing that, and what continue to be some of the big areas of conflict, and how do you see working through those in the future? Well, um, just to start off, for those who want a grounding in NRDC, we are a fierce environmental advocate. We have worked for 40 years, actually starting at Yale, uh, to defend our natural resources and to put in place solutions to the largest environmental problems. Um, so uh, we try to do that in the public policy sector, but for the reasons everyone in this room knows, sometimes it's hard to advance in the public policy sector. I remember a conversation I had uh, at Yale actually with President Levin and Janet Yellen, maybe in 2000 and 2001, talking about climate change. They said, well, you know, simplest thing to do, we should just put on a carbon tax. Great. That's a good thing to think about, and it's a good thing to say, but in this environment and the political sphere, it's almost impossible to achieve, or at least right now. So, you know, over the last, I would say, 10 years, NRDC has been looking more and more at how you uh, identify solutions, how you work with this, the business community, but with the ultimate purpose of translating them back into the public policy sphere. Because uh, in our view, even the, the best intentioned companies don't take over an entire sector. And when you look at the fundamental problems that Dean Crane identified and the trends uh, that we as a society are going down as far as the use of our natural resources and the losses and the uh, stresses on those resources, measures by individual companies or um, you know, in a voluntary pattern just don't achieve the scale that we need to. And both uh, Peter and Vaughn talked about how do we go to scale. I think that's really the key issue uh, for this whole panel. I mean, there are a lot of solutions out there, and I'm going to talk about a few of examples uh, in which NRDC works with the private sector and with the business community, but none of them actually achieve the goals that we have to uh, reach. Uh, climate change dominates the work that we do. The urgency of moving to a clean energy uh, society, not only in the United States, but globally, is absolutely uh, the most fundamental driver that we face. We're far from achieving it. We don't have the policies in place. The technologies are not there uh, at the scale that they need to be. But uh, we can't give up. At this point, we have to look at what are the pieces that we could put in place uh, how do we create a learning environment? How do we develop the collaborations and associations that can ultimately get us there, hopefully in the political space in the United States, then uh, globally as well? And you know, there's a top-down approach and there's a bottom-up approach, and we use both. Uh, you know, in the early days of NRDC, we did do a lot of litigation. We still litigate uh, quite a bit. It's one of the tools. Now we have many, many others. But in the beginning, it was sort of like, you know, we're the environmental community, and we're going to go after the polluters. Mm -hmm. But now the fact is we're all the polluters. And I think that's really what happened. You know, society in and of itself uh, creates the use of natural resources. We each have our own carbon footprint. 
we have to take on the personal responsibility as well as the societal responsibility to really address these issues uh, individually and collectively. It needs to happen at every level of government and through every sector in society. And I think that one of the things that's just become super clear to me over the years of working on these issues that is that if you take any issue and just using climate change as one of them, and you decide this is an environmental issue and it has to be dealt with through environmental strategies, you will ultimately fail. Because an issue like climate change that affects uh, all reaches of society, it's health issues, it's uh, economic issues, human well-being, it's ultimately uh, you know, a, a, an issue of, uh, of the commons. And if we don't treat it that way by integrating all sectors together, uh, we fail. So that's, I think, one of the really wonderful things about Yale, about the School of Forestry, the School of Management. There is a tremendous amount of integration going on here, and the more, the better. Um, so just to use a few examples of uh, areas that we're working in, um, they're all interesting, and they do have good results, but none of the results reach the scale that we want to reach. So I'll, I'll just throw three out there uh, that we've worked on recently. Um, so for us, the cheapest, fastest way to reduce emissions is through advancing energy efficiency. Energy efficiency is an incredibly exciting field, but it's very amorphous. It's not like building a wind turbine or putting on a solar panel. And it's really been hard, and we've been working on it for 30 years, to get companies, to get lead, you know, uh, political leaders to embrace efficiency as a central issue in their work. Actually, that shifted in 2008 when the economy went south. Suddenly, efficiency for the first time, and honestly, we've been working on this issue for more than three decades, it became a centerpiece. It was like a breakthrough. I was like, you need a recession in order to see the advantage of this. Apparently, you do. So uh, in this case, it was a good thing. So uh, there's a lot more interest in efficiency. Um, and we work on it across all the appliance sector. We worked on refrigerators, washing machines, dishwashers, et cetera. Now we're in the electronic sector. So you know, most people don't know that the largest single use of electricity in their home is now electronics, home electronics. Mm -hmm. It's not appliances because that problem's been solved. And you know, everyone in this room is carrying around how many plug-in items. And when you travel, you're taking batteries with you. And these are all um, energy vampires. So we're constantly looking at you know, how do we, uh, how do we uh, get much more efficiency out of all these technologies. So two weeks ago, we had a breakthrough um, with those companies that make TV set boxes. So most people have TVs. Uh, many of you are connected to cable. You have a little box on your TV. It's your DVR or TiVo or whatever it is. These things use a tremendous amount of energy. Um, and so we reached an agreement with both the cable companies and the manufacturer of the set boxes to put in energy efficiency standards for them, which will save literally a billion dollars of electricity bills in the United States over the course of the year. They uh, became effective January 1st. That's uh, up to 45% of the amount of energy that's currently going into those set boxes. They use $3 billion uh, a year worth of energy across the country. There's 280 million of them. So it's sort of a small thing. And what it shows you is every single thing needs attention. You know, there's no huge uh, win out there. You've got to go after every set box and every video game and every appliance and every single uh, plug-in thing that we all use, which is not the most exciting or interesting thing, but it actually gets results. So you know, we've worked with companies to do that. What happened is we went to the Department of Energy. We asked them to create a standard. Companies came to us and said, let's see if we can collaborate and reach something voluntarily. We've done that. I hope it works. If it doesn't work and there's a whole system in place to measure the results of that, we will go uh, to DOE and try to create a federal standard. So you know, that's a win. It's not a big enough win for where we need to go, but it does begin to take us down the road. And it also creates a much higher level of consciousness in the mind of the consumer as well as in the mind of the companies. Um, another example, and this one's in China, uh, we're working with uh, the largest retailers, uh, Walmart, Gap, Nike, Target, uh, who um, buy apparel that's made in China and bring it back to the United States. I think something like 30% or more of the apparel in the world uh, is manufactured in China. 
Um, the area that we focus on is the textile industry because it's the most pollu polluting. The chemicals used, the, the amount of water used uh, is just a major polluter in China. And in, in effect, the thing you have to think about is manufacturing has been exported. We've exported our pollution to other countries. And these big international brands bear responsibility for that. There's a lot of attention and visibility for very good reason on labor practices of these big uh, retail and apparel um, manufacturers. But uh, the environmental consequences are similarly big. So we've been working since 2007 with these big uh, companies, uh, multinational companies, to clean up the textile operations. We've identified a series of 10 steps. They have payback in a year. They reduce water pollution, they reduce chemical use, and they reduce energy use. And it's a win-win-win. We have 20 demonstration projects that uh, have been in the field. But scaling that up, I mean, this is not necessarily the first place that these companies want to spend their money. There's no real driver. The driver, Peter mentioned it, is Greenpeace hmm. banging on their door and bringing uh, brand liability to them for these practices. So you know we're on the inside working with them to establish them, but you've got to look at what Greenpeace is doing and saying, you know, there's real value to that because there's not enough incentive, not enough of a driver to get these companies to make the investments in what are pretty obvious uh, practices that can save them money, but the money saved is not enough to propel them into this kind of action. So. We do do a lot of work with companies, and we're proud of the work that we do. And one of the things that I think is most important is developing the relationships so that we can ultimately go together in the public policy sphere and get the codes and standards and rules uh, put in place that we really need ultimately. But it hasn't been enough. And you know, there, I mean, I, don't, I can't think of a company, if you go to the Fortune Green Conference and every sustainability officer uh, comes to that, and the companies are doing a lot of good things, uh, but you know you have to wonder how much, where are the real results in that, and how much is corporate PR? And if you don't have a very strong system of measurement and verification that's public, you'll never know. So you know, I I mean, I'm heartened by uh, the increasing interest in this issue, the amount of commitment that's being made across companies, but for the, um, the challenges that we have in the environmental sector that both Pavan and Peter and uh, Dean Crane alluded to are so great mm. that these measures just don't live up to it. And I mean, NRDC is not in the business of reforming capitalism, but I do think that's the conversation that needs to be had because the measurement of the public good that's being lost in these activities yeah. is just insufficient to get the results that we need so that, in fact, we are a sustainable society, that we can provide for the future, and that uh, the people across the world actually have uh, the fundamental natural services that they need to survive. Because that's really the issue that's at stake, is whether people at all walks of life in all countries have clean air, have clean water, have sufficient food, can survive. Because the more that we use resources in a way that's unsustainable, makes it much more difficult for people in other parts of the world to, uh, to have a sustainable future. Thank you very much, Francis. Um, and that leads to this question of sitting here in one of the bastions of capitalism, if you will. Um, you know, thinking about what's the role of business schools, what's the role of business students in helping to scale up or put on a more sustainable path. I figured we should take an opportunity, or take the moment to have our panelists talk about that a little bit. So Francis, if you don't mind, I might ask you to just pick up where you left off and bring that to MBA students and MBA programs. Well, I think, um, thank you. I think that uh, this issue of measurement and verification, of setting up, and this is th something I think uh, could be done at SOM, it could be done at SOM in collaboration with the forestry school. Um, to look at how do you actually measure these externalities? How would we actually change an economic system so um, those uh, resources that are the public good that we use every day are actually part of the equation? This is a conversation that's been going on, I'd have to ask Marion and Brad, I mean decades, my entire career. People have been talking about 
how do you incorporate the uh, cost of the externalities into our economic model? We've failed. It hasn't happened. I'd say the need is much more pressing now than ever. But I think it has to be very concrete. So, you know, actually creating the models that do it, there's some work going on right now that Nature Conservancy and Dow Chemical have, I think, a very innovative project to kind of figure that out for Dow. But again, you know, that's a model of one company. How do you take that and actually have it permeate the economic sector in a way that it hasn't? So I think that um, a lot of the ideas can uh, be explored at the schools. And uh, you know the management schools. It's interesting. After uh, the economic crisis, a lot of the, I guess, all the business schools took on business ethics as sort of a central issue that had to be explored. And I think that um, environmental constraints is a central issue that has to be explored too. Because I don't think anybody's going to be coming out of this school or the other business schools who isn't at some point in their career in some way going to be faced with these challenges. And the more environmental literacy and awareness there is of these issues, I think it'll help enormously in, uh, in people's careers as they develop. Avan, two cents. Yeah, let me pick off from uh, where Francis left in terms of the, the need to understand valuation of externalities. The good news is that there is a big coalition. Uh, Peter's a board member of that. It's called the Natural Capital Coalition, which is uh, steadily working towards this. But is this being taught? That's the question that I have to ask. And if taught, then how? So here's two points in relation to that, which I think would be issues at a business school, which is, are you integrating sustainability uh, in the way that it is delivered uh, in the syllabus? Or are you just delivering it as an add-on somewhere else? And typically, it's the latter that's happening. I'm sure there's a finance and accounts course which covers all the IFRS out here and which teaches you exactly all the, the nitty-gritty of finance and accounts, accounting especially. And it is a complex subject. But I'd be surprised to find in that section a module on valuing externalities, both negative and positive, and, a sec and maybe a lecture on IIRC, the International Integrated Reporting Council. I'd actually be surprised to find two or three lectures in a finance and accounts module. But why not? Why not? My point is that we must try and integrate the content and not just uh, sort of integrate syllabuses. And I'm a great admirer of what's happening between FES and SOM in terms of I think for the last 20, 30 years, uh, Peter, you've had this, the, the, the dual degree. But the dual degree is still delivered as two separate sets of syllabuses. Mm -hmm. And that's really the challenge. How do we get the topic, the content, to be integrated and not just in the student's head and it's left right. to the student to figure out what bit from here connects to what bit from there? So I think that's one, one point I'll make. The other is um, something I came across recently, mm. um, which is an oath. Now, uh, we're all familiar with the Hippocratic Oath for Doctors. And the question was asked by a group of students, uh, MBA students at Harvard, why can't there be a Hippocratic Oath, so to speak, for business managers? And they've set that up, and uh, there's more than 40 schools, including, uh, I learned this from the uh, president of uh, um, George Mason University. Um, they, this is quite interesting, and here's, here's from George Mason how they envisage their vision and the mission on this oath. The idea being that business school students and all students who are heading towards business take an oath which basically ensures that they commit to certain standards of integrity and they commit to certain uh, public service as being part of their, their uh, credo, more or less, as business managers. So their vision is a day when business leaders will hold themselves to the higher standards of integrity and service to society. That is a hallmark of a true professional. And at this day, both the schools that, that prepare them and the organization in which they work will understand the reach, the responsibility, and the impact that managers have on the well-being of people inside and outside their organizations. And then they talk in their mission in terms of leveraging a network of network to deliver people who have this commitment to integrity and this, this commitment to uh, social service. Now, of course, one could say, well, yes, I'm surely this school can better that oath. Yes, I'm sure you could. You know, mine is better than yours. This is a typical practice in business. I've been an investment banker for 27 years, so I know a bit about that. But my advice is please don't do that. Just get together with the other business schools. Have one oath, <coughs> one kind of Hippocratic oath, if you like. Call it whatever you wish. Have one which cuts across the major business schools in the US, and I can guarantee you other business schools will follow. It will make a difference.
So Peter, let me ask you to be Dutch. Oh, there it is, yeah. <laughs> so well, let me first, diplomatic and let me first uh, convince the audience, yes, we were in the same lunch. We did not have the same food. So we're not, we haven't all been smoking the same stuff. Because <laughs> I realize this panel. <laughs> This, Today, this, this, <laughs> pan, this panel sounds rather in agreement, which is always boring, I think. But <laughs> so um, I look at the world as a spaceship, and you are all astronauts on the spaceship, and I'm an astronaut on the same spaceship. And the spaceship is in trouble. The engine is huffing and puffing, and you know bits and pieces are falling off, and. It doesn't matter whether you're in government, in business, in the NGO world, or in the academic world. Unless we fix this spaceship, we're all going to suffer and probably die. The spaceship will still keep floating through space, but us will not be there, which for the spaceship may actually be better, but <laughs> that's another discussion. Um, so I have, if, if I think about business schools or universities as a generic, or Yale, the university, I understand, <laughs> and, and the topic of sustainability, I think the first thing that Yale has to do is think about themselves as astronauts. And of course, you may think you're slightly smarter astronauts than the other astronauts, and that's fine, <laughs> but you're on the same spaceship. So I think the academic world needs to get out of its observer role and into its solution provider role. And that's a big step to make. And you know, you've heard three people on the panel pretty much saying the same thing. We need a massive transformation of society. We need a redesign of capitalism. We need to completely rethink the way we balance demand and supply of resources. And by the way, we haven't said much about it, but the social structures in this planet are completely mm. broken as well. Inequality is way beyond mm. what it should be. And that's an all other topic. So I was here yesterday. I arrived from Switzerland yesterday. And I had the great fortune to spend a few hours with a few faculty members. And I had four speed dates, they were called. <laughs> they were like amazing people, you know. Like I, I met mom. Marion Churto, our psychologist. Otherwise known as mom. <laughs> I was allowed to call her mom. I don't know why, but we built that up. <laughs> I met somebody about uh, urbanization, uh, sustainable urbanization, uh, communication of climate change. And in each of these 30-minute speed dates, I learned stuff that despite having been in the circus for two years full-time, mm. I had never, ever known about. And I certainly didn't know that somebody had such deep knowledge. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is open up and become part of the debate. And, and become part of the solution provider. Do not sit on all this knowledge, you know? Mm. The place is going down the tubes. Mm. You can sit and write about it, but it's going down the tubes so fast, we need you to come out and help. Mm. Secondly, for MBAs, it is absolutely clear that 10 years from now, the revolution of capitalism will have happened. Mm. Why is that? Because Pavan and myself will make it happen. <laughs> And if you think Pavan and myself are not credible, then it's the people outside throwing bricks through your windows. And you made one mistake in this building, you put too many windows in. <laughs> Very easy to break glass in this place. And it, do not laugh. Do not laugh. Go to South Africa. Yeah. Go to China. See the social tensions in society. You, you are a bunch of elitists, you know, and, and I congratulate you for it. But they will come after you if you do not fix it because you do lose the license to lead the world. Mm. And so therefore, we have only one choice. We either change the system ourselves or it will be changed for us. And therefore, we are going to change it. Mm. The third thing is to the students. And you look younger than I do, so I assume your students, right? This might be completely unfair, but if you're students, um, I think you guys need to do a whole lot of things while you study. When I studied, my life was extremely simple. I tried to make the marks that you had to make, and for the rest, I dreamt about being CEO in a large company. 
and I had a wish list of the companies I wanted to be CEO of. And in my case, it worked out okay. You know, we, we had a 190,000 people company, so the, my dream came out. But that's a dream in a system that was probably already broken then, but I didn't know it, and now I do. Do not have that dream. Mm. Dream big new dreams. Dream dreams of a completely different society. See yourself as the architect of that society. You know, I, I started off saying that one of my intimidations this afternoon is that English is not my mother tongue. So occasionally I have to pick up the dictionary to understand what it is you're trying to tell me or which words I should use to talk to you. And the word leadership is often used in places like this. And I, I like the word leadership as well. It sounds really cool, you know, if you're a leader and you get microphones on your chest and then you can really convince yourself. But if you, if you go into the history of English, the language, and you figure out what does the word leader mean? When, when the word was invented, what were people trying to tell each other when they used that word? It actually means pathfinder. That's what a leader is, a pathfinder, meaning going to places where there is no path yet, the leader, he or she finds the path. And that is what we so desperately need. If we're gonna go through a transformation of the society that I think many people in this room will recognize we need, there is no path for that. There is no recipe for it. I can shout until I'm blue in the face that we need to redesign capitalism, but if I'm honest about it, I also don't know what that precisely means. We still need to find those passes. And you students are in the incredibly unique opportunity to sit in one of the most beautiful buildings on the planet in, in the years just before the bricks are flying through the windows and you can create an environment where you find these paths. And all I ask you to do is to dig as deep into yourself as you can and find courage. Mm. Because courage is what is going to, go, going to be required more than anything else in this transition. So I'm incredibly proud to be here. I give you all the resources that our little unit has to work with you, to work with Yale University to work with all the 25 other international universities, because unless we are able to mobilize the next generation of leaders, we're not gonna make it. So I count on you guys. Thank, mm -hmm. you. Thank you very much, Thanks, Peter. And you can see why we're so excited to be working with Peter's organization across the Global Network for Advanced Management. Mm -hmm. And part of what Pavan touched mm -hmm. on, I think, and Francis as well, was um, finding these examples. Mm -hmm of good ways forward and trying to connect them more widely. So I'm very excited to say that we're through the Global Network for Advanced Management launching our first online class, bringing students together from across <coughs> the Global Network schools to, to, to jump in on these questions mm -hmm. around materials, energy, food, water, climate, natural areas, uh, and say, look, these are not baked cases we're asking you to figure out the answer to that everybody's known for 30 years. These are real dilemmas facing real companies, mm -hmm. facing the planet, and we need your engagement on that. So very, very exciting. Um, and the panel actually worked really well. We've got an extra three minutes and 29 seconds for questions. Uh, so let me just, a couple of quick rules on questions. Um, the microphones in front of you have a button if you hold the button down, the mic will work. That's really important because this is being live streamed out mm -hmm. to a global audience. Uh, and the microphone only works for as long as you hold the button. So uh, please ask your questions, keep it held, and then, and then release it. And if you would give your name and your affiliation, uh, that would be great too. Please. Uh, I'm Ed McKinley, and I'm the class of 1979. Thank you all. Uh, one question that I keep coming up against in this uh, series of questions that you've all read <coughs> is that the developed world, no matter how much it does, won't solve the problem unless action is taken in the less developed countries. I don't have a good answer for that. I mean, I think the answer is probably yes, and also, so what? But it nonetheless is an important question that I'd like to get the panel's response to. So Francis and then Pavan and then Peter, if you want to 
So for most of the issues that we're talking about, everybody has to take responsibility. The United States on climate, largest <clears throat> emitter over time, has primary responsibility to get going. And I actually think not only do we have responsibility, there's a huge opportunity there. And looking at it more as an opportunity than a liability as far as unleashing innovation, new businesses, new technologies is a good thing. There's no question that there are emissions all over the planet. And we're certainly working in China. We have an office there. Um, we're working increasingly in India. But you know, I, there's no moving it to someone else's responsibility. And I think you know you have to work where you are. Uh, if you're a US-based company, you need to take responsibility here. If you're a multinational company, you need to take responsibility in all the places that you're working. Hopefully, uh, there will be enough of a, a conversation and a dialogue across countries and across multinationals that people will learn from each other and people will feel a mutual uh, responsibility. And I think that's increasingly happening. If you go to the uh, international climate negotiations, you know, it's still like, well, the United States doesn't go first. We're not going to go. But when you go to any of the major developing countries, certainly China, where pollution, not carbon emissions, but pollution is really paralyzing the society now. The amount of air pollution, water pollution, has reached a level where it's intolerable. That's a, a primary driver to address other issues, including emissions and emission reduction. So, you know, to me, there's no, you know, it, it's their responsibility, not ours, or it's everybody's. The whole system needs to move forward, and there has to be a lot of joint learning and commitments across boundaries, across sectors. None of the issues that really uh, we're concerned about know political boundaries. They have to be addressed in every place. So, uh, you know, t to me, it's sort of we need to move the whole ship forward. Alan? In the spaceship analogy. The spaceship, yeah. Uh, Ed, thanks for the question. And I think what you've uh, put your finger on is the 21st century equivalent of so called common but differentiated responsibilities. So, what are the common but differentiated responsibilities in the 21st century? So today we have a combination of problems, both environmental and social. We have the developing world in Asia, Africa, uh, some countries, Latin America, whose human development index, to use a, a standard of the UNDP, is in the 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6 range, and it should be above 0 0.8. So clearly they need to improve health, education, and per capita GDP. But they need to do that whilst maintaining their footprint, per capita footprint, at sort of under two global hectares per head. This is just a measure of, uh, of uh, our impact on the Earth in terms of the amount of food and water and, and near shore resources that we use and the area involved. Now, how does that work? I mean, that will only work if the developing countries engage a green economy approach, one which delivers them those benefits in terms of social and environment and, and social and economic, but without, if you think about going along the axis of footprint, increasing their footprint. So what we call green development, and that's very much what um, a lot of work at the UN and in many partner countries is, is about. But there's the other side to it, which is the developed world, Europe, North America, um, and Japan, and so on, whose footprint is already way above the average of what the Earth can bear. So collectively, we are already eating up the world's capital in terms of its natural resources and the land space that we use. And we are almost 50% above that. And most of that is coming from the developed world. So whilst they are in the right box, if you like, on human development above 0.8, they aren't in the right box when it comes to environmental footprints, which are in the fives and 10 global hectares when it should be below two. So you need resource efficiency, a revolution, if you like, if I may use that term, in resource efficiency. But we are talking about levels of resource efficiency and, and levels of improvement here, which are already possible with existing technology. Books like Factor 4 and now Factor 5 have been written explaining how to deliver this. One of these was written in 1989, not yesterday, but 1989. So these are all um, objectives which are within our current capacities technologically, unfortunately, the landscape, the system, and the trillion dollars of subsidies that we are constantly throwing every year towards the brown economy make it somewhat difficult for companies to align their incentives towards the green economy. I don't think we need to finance a green economy. I think we just need to stop financing the brown economy. 
just level the football field, stuff will move in the right direction. Peter, do you want to comment on any of that? Well, I've, I've been to three climate change uh, negotiations, these global things, which lead to absolutely nothing. Um, and it's arguments like this that you hear flying around there, which I always leave rather depressed. Because the flip side of your argument is being used as well, saying, why should we as developing countries do anything? I mean, if climate change is a problem, it's America and Europe and other countries who have put these emissions up. Let these people fix it and we'll just, why should our lives not be mm. like the lives of people here? I've also always said that, you know, if every Chinese person adopts the American dream, mm. then we've just been wasting an hour and four minutes because the planet will be dead, you know? And that's, there's elements of stuff to think through. Pavan and I, we had a discussion last night. If you land on Delhi airport in India, mm. you come out of the terminal building there, you walk, I don't know if you've ever been, but if you're there, you walk against the side of the wall of the parking garage of Delhi airport, which is the largest billboard in the world. Mm. Mm. I won't name the company, but <laughs> it's, a, it's a car <laughs> company <laughs> that, that always puts up photos and advertisements of cars with 700 horsepowers and more. You know, the most expensive cars that you know, most people, well, this room probably is unfair, but most rooms I get to talk to would not be able to afford. And why would you want to advertise that car in India where, you know, less than a tenth of a percent of the population could ever dream of owning that car? when that same company is also producing really eco-friendly cars. Why don't yeah. you yeah. make that the dream yeah, than an Indian dream? <laughs> and so this comes back to Pavan's point that he always makes so well, that there's also something to do with responsible advertising. Mm. What are the products that we're going to try to sell to China, to India, to the new economies? Mm. If, if we're going to sell them the stuff that all of us have been buying, <laughs> and you know where that's going to end. And we don't want it to end that way, so we need to change that. But as, as an overall question, it depresses me because it, it leads to us against them. And I don't like us against them because we're all astronauts at my little spaceship and the spaceship is in trouble. What I would suggest you spend your energy and your intelligence on, and that's what we're trying to do with our businesses, let's look at these topics, let's bring them down to risk management for my business, for my sphere of influence, for whatever it is you do. And translate that to, okay, if, if you know, a car company has an assembly line in the southern part of Thailand, which has been hit by two consecutive, in two consecutive years has been hit by mud floods because rain patterns are changing and the thing is a mess. Droughts in, in the Midwest here in America have similar phenomena. That completely changes the risk profiles in your business some of these operations are no longer insurable. That completely changes the financial risks. What are you gonna do about those type of topics in your sphere of influence? And if we're smart about that, work together with governments, with NGOs, with, with companies, within companies with, or, or across companies, within sectors, then I would hope to get the scale. I, by the way, predict that China will lead us out of this trouble because China has a slightly more easy model to make transformative change work. And the air quality, <laughs> is that uh, politically not correct, sorry. No? <laughs> um, so um, the air quality issue in China is focusing their minds. The industrial policy, the link between government and business, the way they now conquer the solar industry, the battery industry, will position them strategically incredibly well for the society that we need. So I don't think the developing countries are the problem. They might bring solutions. I think Europe, America really needs to step up what they're doing. Questions? Yes. Wow. Hi, uh, Jonathan Dayton, class of 09. Um, in the last 30 years, I think energy consumption has gone up by an order of magnitude. and. Uh, you've talked a lot about production and um, greater energy efficiency, but it seems to me that if, um, if we become much more energy efficient and yet the rest of the world adopts 
uh, smartphones and iPads and, and we adopt more types of these consumer electronics that was touched on a little bit before, no matter how energy efficient you are, you're still going to have a crisis because it's been driven by consumption. I'd just like to hear your thoughts about that. Uh, well, I, I think energy efficiency is an important thing to focus on, but at best it will buy us some time. It's not going to be the solution to what we need. Uh, I think in sustainability, and, and I count our own work in, into that category as well, we're all incredibly good and focused on the uh, what I call the supply side of sustainability, mm -hmm. on energy efficiency, resource productivity, being smarter on that side, we're not very well tuned yet on what is the demand side of sustainability. How do we change mindset? How do we bend the curve of energy demand and, and, and demand for other materials for that matter? Um, so I, I, I think it requires a fundamental holistic review of everything. Mm -hmm. And unless we change the economic system, because the economic system we have is totally based on growth. There is no economic theory mm. for a no growth or a negative growth. We don't have it. We call it a recession or a depression or mm. something terrible. Mm. And yet, if you want to reduce the emissions, which we all know we, we have to, you know, emission is, is, not, is not a religion as in this country it sometimes sounds to, to be. It's just mathematics, you know? We're at 565 gigatons in the atmosphere today. We can go up to a trillion tons, depending on which probability you will believe. We put out 32 gigatons each year, which is growing at three to 5% each year. We have 20 years left, and then we're at a trillion ton, which means we're gonna go through the two degrees. So if you want to not go through two degrees, you have to kind of try to peak at 2020 and then reduce by 5% globally each year. So you like it, you don't like it, but there is going to come a year pretty soon that the globe is going to have to reduce emissions by 5%. So we're going to have to go to a world of less. Well, that's either less stuff or other ways to avoid that we can do more stuff and not have the negative impacts. And that's the mathematics we have to solve. And it's, it's, that's, it's quite a simple game, actually. It's <laughs> quite hard to change the mindset, mm. but the game is not difficult. Mm. Yep. Hi, my name is Tistan, and I'm one of the students here that will be dodging the bricks coming through the, the window. Uh, um, but I think in, in, in all seriousness, I'd love to hear from you about the accomplishments that you think that organizations such as yours have made in the past decade. I mean, we keep hearing about uh, emergencies, but deforestation has not stopped. You know, cap and trade and carbon credits have not been implemented in a meaningful way. The smog in Beijing is, you know, worse than ever. Uh, country, countries such as Yemen are running out of drinking water. Companies like Mauritius are going underwater and will cease to exist like Atlantis. So what really has been accomplished? Are we, are we just more aware and have not practically done anything in the past decades? Or are there achievements that we should, as you know, leaders of tomorrow, as you mentioned, learn from and leverage as case studies as we move forward? Well, then yeah. you start? Sure. I mean, I, I can kick the, the, we could be here till tomorrow discussing an answer to your question. But let me just say a few points that uh, it's true that they've that we've been collectively, collectively, no any particular group, sector, collectively short on accomplishment, but I think we certainly have advanced knowledge. Why have we been short on accomplishment? Because in my opinion, fundamentally, we are following the wrong theory of change. We seem to rely on agreeing things between 194 nations on issues which are complex and public goods issues. There aren't even 192 people. Can everyone agree on which movie to see tonight, please? Mm. And these are all very intelligent, sensible people. It doesn't work that way. So we have to recognize that today it's about changing economic direction and resource use. That means about looking at the demand side and the supply side, but on the supply side, recognizing that you probably have, whether you're thinking about airlines or apparels or well, anything along the alphabet, you're probably looking at 10 or 20 major multinationals who, who produce 80 or 90% of the output of that particular sector. And they probably do that based in no more than five or ten countries. So the relevant dialogue that has to take place about solving the sustainability issue of the airline sector or the apparel sector or the any other sector or the agriculture sector, massive one, is going to have to be in rooms which are much smaller 
but with the relevant people, the sector and the five or 10 relevant governments. One example of that, which has just begun, is what uh, you may have heard of the, the Tropical Forest Alliance, where President Yudhiyono of Indonesia and Paul Pullman, chairman of Unilever, together addressed a large body of uh, business leaders from just four sectors, essentially pulp and paper, beef, soya, and, and, uh, and palm oil, on the challenge of how to reduce their collective impact, their collective impact on deforestation to zero by 2020. That's the kind of defined, confined challenge to a particular group of people supported by the relevant governments, who in this case would be Indonesia, Brazil, India, and a few others in the US and China. So I think we need to recognize that, yes, we have underperformed, if you want to uh, look at it that way, but if there's a context to it, and we need to learn this new theory of change very, very quickly. At least let us draw my final point on that is that there are some amazing success stories. Bangladesh, solar PV. Look at the model there, the microfinance model of solar PV. They have two million homes out there where housewives are basically mini electricity companies delivering energy to the neighboring eight, 10 homes, basically paying for the solar panel that they've bought through microfinance, paying the banker by the value of the, of the savings of their neighbors on not using the, the dreadful kerosene uh, lighting that they otherwise use. Or look at uh, uh, the system of rice intensification. Rice feeds most of the developing world. Everyone assumed that China has the best output in rice. In Bihar, which is a state in India which is not famous for success, um, they have produced 20 tons, 22 tons actually, of rice per hectare using a system of rice intensification, planting the, the plants separately, using less water, and completely in a sustainable manner. It actually works. So who is now scaling up and who is replicating these models? Hardly anyone. There isn't a second Bangladesh and there isn't a second state like Bihar. Why not? These are the challenges that I'd like us to bring to the, to the attention of both business as well as policymakers to level off the playing field and in fact to move things forward in the right direction. Francis? So I think to your point, because you're going to be throwing the rocks through the window, that um, the voice of people is a usually important part of the equation. I mean, if you look at what is it that can counterbalance the, the, uh, the power of politics or the power of corporations, it's individual people. And so, you know, and you really see that now beginning to happen in China with air pollution, that the pollution is so high, you know, the levels of uh, uh, particulates in the atmosphere are so far beyond what the health equation is that this is a national conversation that's going on and it's one that is uh, taken on very seriously at the highest levels of government because they're going to have a revolution if they don't take responsibility for controlling these emissions. Uh, people are very alarmed about the well-being of their children. Uh, they have one child. The child could have developmental problems from uh, exposure to toxics, air pollution levels, mercury, et cetera. So don't leave out in all these models how important the voice of concerned citizens is. And I think it is a huge part of the equation because I think it's one of the things that actually provides the leverage. Mm. One of the big challenges in all of this is there's so many human ills out there. These ones that we're talking about have a lot to do with human well-being and the environmental sector. but. The thing that moves them to the top of the plate of either a political leader or a corporate leader is hearing back from consumers, from affected parties, from the electorate. And uh, you know, for a long time, when I was here at Yale as undergraduate, I could tell you the voice of young people was very loud on the Vietnam War, also on the environment. I think we're reaching a new stage of that kind of uh, awareness and voice and I think it is a critical part of the equation to make the transformation that we're talking about. It's not going to happen otherwise because the urgency, there's not the urgency there to propel it. Even, you know, even all the science that you read, science doesn't create um, public outcry. It's people's individual experiences in their own families, in their own communities, in their own homes. Now in the United States, we're seeing that with the fracking uh, boom that's going on across the country. We're actually, for the first time in uh, my experience, in a national conversation about what our energy future is. And the national conversation is not about the problems of climate change. It's the, it's the issue of, is everybody going to have energy development in their front yard, backyard, next door to their school? And that has to do with 
fracking, it has to do with coal exports in the, in the Northwest, it has to do with uh, the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, it has to do with uh, oil tankers that are coming down through Lake Champlain to the Hudson River. I mean, suddenly people across the U.S. are looking around and mm -hmm. energy's in their front yard. It's not in Texas and Oklahoma. It's everywhere, which has allowed a conversation of, is this the future we want for this country to be fossil fuel dependent, or are we going to try to segue to a cleaner energy future? It's very interesting watching it happen, but I think that the power of voice is a huge part of the equation of social change and don't leave it out. So there was a question there, I think, maybe. Yeah. Hi. Um, press I'm the button. A, Can you press the button? Uh, yep. Hold it down, please. Sure. My name is Gloria Joan Patel, and I'm actually a spouse of the Yale. Um, but I have a degree in forestry and seat, a business degree. Press the button. You have to hold the button down. <laughs> <You know>. Sorry. <laughs> So again, my name is Gloria Stone Platel, and I am a spouse of Ayeli, um, who went to SOM, graduated in 98, that's Philip Platel. I have a forestry degree from a competing school, as well as an MBA from a competing school. And so I really, really value the conversation here, and um, am very impressed of um, actually the accomplishments that have been made. So when I was getting my forestry degree in the early 90s, the conversation about how to internalize externalities was fringe. It was really, really fringe. And so to hear how far it's come, here we are, what, 20, 30 years, oh, 25 years later maybe? And to see that this is actually getting tremendous focus by corporations and by governments is really a huge accomplishment. So I really, really um, commend everybody who's has moved that conversation forward. Some of the things that um, I'm wondering about is what are the triggers to help motivate corporations to look to what those externalities are and how can they reduce them? And then how can we, again, take that and put those, make those arguments and present them to other corporations? Um, additionally, I do want to comment on um, the piece about uh, public input. One of the things that when I was in forestry school that I was really taught was the value of public input and that in, uh, incorporating that makes much better regulations. Um, I actually work in healthcare now, and a lot of that is, uh, um, is having really strong your, benefits. Your question to uh, So could suppose? you just talk, uh, could you talk about uh, how you, um, what the triggers are for corporations yeah. to help them internalize externalities. Great, thank you. Peter? Yeah, um, I, I look at that as a journey. Mm -hmm. And uh, different companies and different CEOs will be on different stations along the tracks. Mm -hmm. So I think the, uh, the initial stage that we currently see most pulling power is visionary leaders. Mm -hmm. There are CEOs who just get it, you know? The, uh, Madam Indra from PepsiCo this morning, I think, is an inspiring example in your country. Paul Pullman is an inspiring example in Europe, and there's more. They're, they're a minority, but they're very inspiring. They get it, they drive it. No system, no rule, no nothing is required. Jochen Zeitz from Puma, who was the first guy who implemented the EPNL, he's done it. Nobody told him to, but he knew that that was. What was the EPNL? Uh, ecological PNL. So the, he actually calculated all the externalities, even monetized them, and made a PNL, a profit and loss statement, out of it. So that's that's the the further station out at the moment. Yeah. The shorter stations that that are being developed as we speak have all to do with risk management, corporate governance. You know, if you have an assembly line in a flat area which cannot be insured anymore, you better start thinking about these topics. Every company will have to start doing that. The next station is, what do you do with measurement and disclosure? Your non-financial reporting. And there's very interesting stuff in uh, San Francisco here. SASB, the Sustainable Accounting Standard Setting Board, mm. is now on a materiality basis developing per sector what are the non-financial elements that each business should disclose. The next stage is what Pavan mentioned is IIRC. The Integrated Reporting Council, who a month or so ago have launched their number 1.0 framework for how companies should uh, do integrated reporting. The next stage is to look at the, the work that TEEP does and the B team do 
around the valuation of externalities. And then the last step, and that's one of the toughest steps because it's an audience which is very hard to engage, is how do we bring this to capital markets mm -hmm. so that valuations uh, will be impacted by how good or how bad your sustainability performance is. Because at the end of the day, it's, it's very simple. Unless we change the system in such a way that more sustainable businesses will become more successful, mm. we're not going to make it. Yes. There's not enough visionary leadership to, to, to make the transformation work. The system needs to reward the change. And that's the journey we're on. And uh, the train is moving fast, a faster train than you have in your country. I think that um, there are a lot, there are a number of examples of uh, visionary leaders who've taken on uh, various aspects uh, of sustainability and developed models. I think ultimately the models have to be uh, adopted as, in policy. They have to be uh, created in standards that are universal across the sector. I don't think um, that even with the best intentions, the voluntary mechanisms ultimately get you to where you have to go. Pavan, this has been your area. What's the, what are you seeing that's hopeful on the corporate side? Sure, I, I think that the, I'll, I'll reiterate and build on what, what Peter said essentially, that we need to get guidance in place and the IIRC is the first level of guidance, which is just basically what is it that we should value and measure and why. And then from the next stage would be how do we measure and value and, and that needs standards, but those again, those standards need to be framed basically by the accountants. So we need to get this dialogue from our space of corporations and, and uh, institutional interests into the space of accountancy bodies, essentially with the IASB, the International Accounting Standards Board, and the FASB here in the US, and already, thankfully, uh, the ICAW in the UK is very much a part of this dialogue. So we need to take it from here into the accountancy space so that they can actually introduce disclosure standards. Now. Um, I was delighted that you thought we'd made progress. I always feel we haven't. But, um, but my, my worry is that the time is running out. The, the planet and its physics and its chemistry and its biology don't negotiate. So you know, we, we, are, we, are count, we have the most exciting, literally the ringside seats to this clash of non-negotiable titans, if you like. The previous president, George Bush, talked about the American way of life being non-negotiable. The planet tells us that its boundaries are not negotiable and we are sitting there watching this tennis match between one and the other. Um, maybe neither will win and that's the challenge. We need to act before this match gets a bit rude. And I think that's where the challenge really lies. Well, since we only have a few minutes left, I might take a second just to ask you to follow up on one aspect. When this conversation about externalities was happening in the States, the rivers were on fire mm. and the response was government. Mm. Where is government? in this conversation at this point. We're talking about accounting standards and we're talking about mm. capital markets, mm. um, but that's happening within the overview of SEC regulations, mm. um, in the overview of the tax code, a variety of different things. Is, are we just sort of forgetting about government for a little while or is there I, room there <laughs> for action? I, I would say the government needs to be really, really very focused, any government today, on where it puts in its efforts. That's why I think it's about micro policy reform which is in, in a sense four things. It's about taxation, which is very much in the hall of government. It's about finance ministries. Tax the bads, don't tax the goods. Reduce the taxes on the goods, increase on the bads. And that will change economic direction and resource use. Get the right information out in front of policymakers, administrators, people, c consumers, NGOs, et cetera, which means disclosing externalities. That's fairly and squarely in the uh, the, the body of accountants and, and the technicians, essentially, the people who are working in team and so on. Then it's about advertising. Get the truth out. I mean, advertising is a powerful force. It, it basically, it, it, it's right now about good selling, but it can be about selling good. Nobody pays them to do that. That's why they don't. But it's a very powerful voice. It's only half a trillion dollars of turnover, but look at the influence of advertising. So we need to work with the advertising uh, sectors and, and the associations, and that's a dialogue to be had. And I'm delighted actually it's begun. And, and finally, last and not, not the least, where I came from, finance, it, it, it doesn't rule the world. It doesn't, shouldn't think that it does, but it's hugely important, creating the leverage that empowers company to grow too big to fail. To me, that's where the next big crisis is coming from. 
So once again, it's about central banks and finance ministries. So I think there's a huge lot to be done by government, but the question is which arms of government and very, very focused action and coordinated action. Otherwise, I'm afraid it's a ringside seat on a match that you don't want to see the end of. Maybe on that cheery note, <laughs> I'd ask Dean Crane to come up and, and offer a few closing thoughts. Yeah, I mean, it's very difficult to follow. Uh, this has been a great, uh, really great discussion. I think you can see why uh, the, both the value and the importance of the two schools working together. Uh, and uh, we've made some good progress on that. We need to make some more. Time is running out. Uh, I think, actually, if you reflect back, we have made some progress on some of these environmental issues, but not fast enough. Uh, when I grew up in London, the air quality was about where it is in Beijing. Yeah. Uh, right now, and we have improved, uh, but time is running out. We have got to, to continue to make progress. And uh, you know, every student that gets cross-trained between, and, and the more integrated, the better for that, I agree, that gets cross-trained between these two schools is an investment in the future. And so uh, you know, as I think about the future of our school, the future of the School of Management, and the program uh, together uh, that we operate, investing in the students, making sure that they are exposed to these ideas, that they go out into the world, and uh, it doesn't matter whether they infiltrate the M NGOs or the companies, uh, in the long run that's going to pay dividends, and I hopefully it'll be in the short run. So please join me in thanking this wonderful panel and our great moderator.